sore muscles from my last trip, and uh, I sure was referring to the exercise in the Olympic training. No, the thing that I'm boasting about today is that yesterday at the graduation at the Air Force Academy, I stood and shook 993 hands. It's the flesh. The largest, largest graduating class in the history of the academy. But you managed to embrace a very good-looking officer. Well, uh, no, they embraced me. They, <laughs> <laughs> not all of them. There were, uh, well, but there were a few, and it, it was a, uh, a kind of a welcome break <laughs> there. Uh, Mr. President, as a representative from the host country, it's been left to me to bowl the first ball. Um, the London Economic Summit is uh, taking place under a number of clouds. One is the international debt crisis. So far, Western creditor nations have dealt with this problem on a case-by-case -case basis. However, I'd like to ask you, in light of the growing hostility of debtor nations, first of all, whether a coordinated long-term solution is now essential, and second, what the US can do to guarantee confidence of its uh, banking system? Well, first of all, let me answer that by saying that I believe the five-point system that, or program that uh, we all agreed to at the summit meeting last year at Williamsburg uh, has been working, and I'm sure there is unhappiness here and there with some, but uh, I believe that since it is working and it's working on a case-by-case -case basis, that we should continue that and that the greatest thing we can contribute now to helping them in their problems is to do everything we can to uh, ensure and increase, if possible, the economic recovery that is presently taking place. And the, uh, what about uh, the, the U.S. banks? We've had two banks recently which have run into trouble as a result of uh, problems with uh, these debtor countries. Well, now, we had... Uh, the Continental of Illinois, are you referring to the... His manufacturer's hand of Well, hand. that turned out to be uh, quite a rumor that uh, seemed to be believed only on Wall Street and the stock market for 24 hours mm -hmm. and caused quite a panic, but uh, developed that there was not, a, uh, not the same kind of crisis involved there. Mr. President, um, in the last few days you said that uh, the world feels a little bit more secure because of the strengthening in the American strategic and conventional posture. As paradoxical as it may seem, and considering the reported widespread violations of Seoul II by the Soviet Union, uh, do you feel that the world can continue to feel a little bit more secure for an extended period of time in the absence of a, an agreement with the Soviet Union limiting uh, nuclear war, nuclear arms? Well, I think the, the ultimate, what we want, of course, is for them to come back to the table and join us in not a limitation as SALT was that was simply legalizing an arms race in that the limitation was only a limit on how many more uh, you could continue to build. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to note that from the time of the signing by both parties to the SALT Treaty, the Soviet Union added 3,000 950 more warheads. Uh, when I say more secure, I believe that the United States basically in recent decades went all out in various efforts at detente and in which we unilaterally disarmed with the idea that maybe if we did this and showed our good faith, they would reciprocate by reducing their own. Well, they didn't. They've engaged in the most massive military buildup the world has ever seen. And therefore, the reason I believe that uh, there is more security today is the redressing that we've done of our own military strength, the strength of the alliance, and uh, the unity that we have, and the, and the reliance resisted all that propaganda of the Soviets uh, with regard to the intermediate range placement and their efforts to divide us failed. So uh, I think there's an article that could call to your attention in The Economist uh, called May Hibernation. And I, it's, it was a 
idea it hadn't occurred to me, but uh, I think it makes a great deal of sense that they are not deviously planning something or having a great plan going forward. The author of this article said that uh, they don't have any answers right now, so they've just hunkered down and they're hibernating, <laughs> waiting until they, uh, they have an answer. Um, sure, they're unhappy, and all this talk about great strain and in the relations. Well, the unhappiness is because they're not having their way freely as they did a short time ago. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, in, this, in the connection with this uh, problem of the United States-Soviet relations, East-West relations, which my Italian colleague just mentioned, I'd like to ask the, this question. Many observers suggest that United States and the Soviet Union has a common national interest in calming down the present Gulf crisis, Persian Gulf crisis. Mm -hmm. US and Soviet Union have a common interest. Do you agree with this view? If so, would you consider taking this crisis as an opportunity to reopen the US-Soviet dialogue, which so many people is anxious to have? Well, I don't see that particular issue as one uh, lending itself to that. We are not out of touch with the Soviet Union. We have continued to negotiate with them on other matters other than the arms treaties uh, that were of concern to them, and there's been some progress made in those. So we've made it very plain that uh, the door is open uh, for negotiations. On the Gulf, I think the, the idea, none of us want to see this spread into a major conflict, and I think the fact that the Gulf nations themselves have not asked for help other than uh, wanting more weaponry for their own defense uh, here and there and, and which we've provided. And I believe that that is the course to follow. Uh, if, it ever, uh, if it ever goes beyond that, then I think that the major nations would begin with us and our allies uh, getting together because uh, basically our allies, including your own country, uh, have a greater stake in if that energy supply was, was cut off. But uh, no, I don't, I don't believe that that, uh, that, that really offers a, a, the kind of opening we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, but you had, the, you had a direct talk with the Soviet oh, Union yes. on this? Oh, yes, yes. So then, this is a follow-up question. What initiative, if any, do you plan to take at the London summit on this Gulf crisis, on this subject? That what? On, on, on the Gulf, on this Persian Gulf crisis in the summit meeting? Do you plan to take it? Oh, I'm quite sure we'll be What kind of initiative? Oh, I'm quite sure we'll be discussing that. The, the summit meetings, I'm proud and happy to say, since Williamsburg are kind of planned on a more informal basis, uh, they used to be very programmed and with subjects in advance determined on and so forth. And uh, we didn't think when we had the Williamsburg Summit, we didn't think that that really opened the door to what everyone would like to talk about. So it's more or less a, an informal get-together and whatever subject is on anyone's mind they can bring up that they think is of interest to it. And I'm quite sure that we'll, uh, we'll be discussing that. Central America? Uh, well, uh, if I can come back to the economic uh, um, uh, problem, uh, Mr. President, uh, the latest figures uh, on the U.S. export performance um, paint a rather grim picture. Uh, it is understood that the U.S. trade deficit, trade imbalance, will reach a, a staggering $126 billion this year, compounding, uh, it seems, the deficit problem that already exists. How can interest rates really come down under such auspices? And uh, what will you tell your partners at London who are worried stiff already about interest rates and about the high dollar that is created and the capital that comes out of their economies into uh, banks in this country? Um, what, is, what are you going to tell your partners about Well, this? the trade imbalance I don't think has anything to do with the interest rates. The uh, trade imbalance that you've mentioned there, as a matter of fact, uh, is due to the uh, 
value of the dollar in comparison to other currencies, and this is part of the worldwide recession that's been going on, but uh, our, uh, our imports have actually, are actually responsible for about a third of the recovery of our trading partners now. And there is another element that we, uh, we don't consider in, in the balance of trade, but that is capital investment uh, from outside the United States in our country. And yet that is, that is a kind of balance to this imbalance. We would, we'd like very much to be exporting more than we are, but we realize that we, our recovery started earlier and has been faster than it has in the other countries. And so the result is they have been less able to buy, and the very fact, as I say, that we're uh, continuing to import is helping that recovery, and I think that this will uh, move to change that. Now we get to the, the deficit, which is, uh, every country has one right now, uh, the spending uh, over and above revenues in government functions. Uh, we have a program right now that is in conference committee before the House and Senate to work out the differences in their two versions of what I have called a down payment. And that is a three-year program to uh, certain, some revenue increases, but both domestic spending and some reductions in defense spending that will not set us back too much in our program. But this down payment will amount to about 140 or 150 billion dollars over the three-year period in the reduction of our deficit. But that's only part of it. We recognize that we have a long way to go in reducing the share of the gross national product that the government is taking uh, in taxes and in its spending. And we had a commission from the private sector. I asked a man named Peter Grace, a businessman, to f form task forces and go into every agency and department of our government. I had done this in California when I was governor for the state, and it worked. And some 2,000 American leaders in the private sector spent several months doing this, and they have left us with 2,000, I think 478, specific recommendations as to how government can be made more efficient and more economical by simply implementing modern-day business practices. For example, when they could find that in one area of our government it was costing us four dollars and something every time we wrote a paycheck for an employee, and out in the business world that process takes less than a dollar. Well, there's no reason why government shouldn't take less than a dollar in processing a, a paycheck. Well, this kind of thing, and we now have a task force that is working on those recommendations. Many of them will require legislation by the Congress. Some of them only required executive order by me. And we have already, in our, our planning right now and in this um, down payment, we have already included some of their recommendations and are going forward with them. So. We think that, that actually the interest rates, however, that I'm dealing with the deficit part now, are not that closely linked to the deficit. As a matter of fact, uh, the deficit of some of our allies as a proportion of gross national product is uh, not too out of line as a percentage of GNP as uh, any more than ours is. But what I stand on is evidence that it isn't the deficit that is causing the interest rates, the high interest rates, uh, is the fact that we brought those high interest rates down from 21.5% down to uh, a little more than half that at the same time that our deficit was increasing vastly over what it had been. Now. How could that be, that interest rates were coming down while the deficit was going up, and now the deficit is responsible for interest rates not coming down any farther? 
or maybe as they have going, going up a point or so uh, recently. We think that out there in the money market in our own country, after some nearly half a century of deficit spending in this country that, and a growing inflation that has been worldwide for a longer period than ever in the world's history, that the money market is not yet convinced that we have control of inflation. And every move by the Federal Reserve System, they always look to see, well, does this mean that suddenly inflation is going to start? Remember that in 1979 and 80, before we came here, inflation in this country went up to double digits and for two years in a row. It was a double digit and one time it was running at 17%. And since we've been here, it has come down to where for the last two years, inflation has been less than 4%. But I, I believe we're sound in thinking that it is just the lack of confidence. Now, if we pass, if the Senate and the House come together and this down payment is made, and then as we begin to put together the 1985 budget, which we will shortly be doing, and we begin to show in that budget the effect of the Grace Commission reports and so forth, I think we will see uh, a little more confidence out there in the business community, and I think we'll see interest rates come down a little further. Um, Mr. Mr. President, first of all, let me say I'm disappointed you haven't offered us any of those jelly beans, but anyway. <laughs> well, pass them around, help yourselves. <laughs> Good. They always sit there. <laughs> My question, our Prime Minister, Mr. Trudeau, set out on a personal disarmament quest last year based on the assumption that the superpowers were deadlocked, that the world was becoming more dangerous, and that smaller powers might help to break that deadlock, and you got the support and endorsement of the Commonwealth. Now, we came to see you in December. You cooled them out with a non-committal goodwill. You thanked him for his suggestions. You wished him Godspeed, as I recall. Yeah. And in effect, you trivialized his whole undertaking. So my question is, why did you not pick up on this initiative and give it momentum as a new run for arms control? Well, I suppose because we were convinced that it has to be the Warsaw Pact and the NATO, I won't just say the United States and the Soviet Union. Here is where the issue lies. Here's where the threat, if there is one to the world, uh, comes from. And we were busily trying to show the Soviet Union that we hadn't made any demands in which we said it's this or nothing. We tried to show them our flexibility. For example, my first proposal about the intermediate range weapons was, why not zero, zero? Why not leave that European area free of any intermediate range weapons? Well, the Soviets refused to discuss that. So we said, all right, then whatever figure you have in mind or whatever we have in mind, let's sit down then and see how much we can reduce the numbers of weapons. And we told them, frankly, we would always keep in mind that someday we'd still like to have zero, zero, but we were willing to talk a lesser number. Now, they walked away on the, uh, the line that it was uh, that when deployment started. Well, the request for the Peace NATO... Initiative. What? Peace initiative. You're reviewing, you're reviewing uh, disarmament, but this is not, as far as I can tell, nothing to do with the peace initiative. Well, maybe I misunderstood. Uh, well, I was asking about Prime Minister Trudeau's peace, in, peace initiative to try and break the deadlock that the, that the two superpowers were in. Oh, listen, well, no, we encouraged him and gave him our blessing to go forward with that. I think that to, uh, it's awfully easy for us in our relations with the Soviet Union to, to be the kiss of death sometimes to these things. No, the Prime Minister came here. I'm sorry, I misunderstood uh, what you were asking. The, uh, I think the world pretty generally, uh, with just a few exceptions, uh, is ready uh, for world peace. And this is our primary goal. But I don't believe that you can really, that it was, is really on a sound basis unless it is accompanied by a reduction, particularly in the strategic nuclear weapons. This is the threat that we cannot, the world cannot go on living under that threat. 
And one day, if there's any common sense left in the world, one day there will be no nuclear weapons. Our country pre presented that at a time when we were the only ones who had them, 1946. And we suggested an international commission to be given total control over all nuclear material. And the Soviets refused. Now, we knew they were trying to have such a weapon and eventually did. But at that time, they, all they had to do was give in and there, there wouldn't be any. Mr. President, during his visit to Washington, President Duarte of Salvador declared that he would never ask American troops to fight in his country. And uh, last week, uh, you have stated yourself uh, that you had never had any thought of sending American soldiers to Central America. And what would be your reaction if next fall, for example, the government of Salvador was seriously threatened, I mean, uh, with uh, collapse by a guerrilla offensive? The, and again, I have problems with those of you who are further out there. <laughs> this domed room has terrible acoustics here. I think you're asking about El Salvador and Nicaragua, our Central American. Uh, not especially about Nicaragua, but about Salvador. Yeah. If there is next fall, for example, um, a guerrilla offensive, guerrilla. a guerrilla offensive, yeah. threatening and threatening. Uh, with collapse, yeah. the government of Salvador, what would be your reaction? What would be your reaction? Our reaction? Will you send military, will you send military forces there? Well, it would not be military forces because uh, El Salvador has not only never asked for them, but President Duarte on his visit here recently said no, they were not wanted or needed. They will do this with their own forces, but frankly admit they must have our help with regard to equipment and supplies and uh, the help that we've been to them in training. Uh, you know, a great many of the Central American countries, their militaries over the years have been uh, kind of garrison troops, more concerned with internal problems than in fighting a war. And so they have been most open in their uh, request of, of training. And before we got here, my, the previous, under the previous administration, some of that training consisted of bringing El Salvadoran troops up here and training them at our own bases with our own men. Well then, as the war heated up, uh, they couldn't afford to have the men gone for that long a time. So we have 55 trainers working with their entire army. And the guerrillas, of course, are being supplied by way of Nicaragua uh, but uh, through Nicaragua, by, but by Cuba and the Soviet Union, uh, not only with weapons, but with replacements, with personnel. And now the guerrillas are resorting to kidnapping. They're, they're rounding up, going into villages and rounding up uh, even just youngsters off the streets and simply taking them, forcing them to be guerrillas. And uh, as would happen, the law of averages, every once in a while some of those youngsters escape and get away and so we know that this is the practice and what they're doing. But no, if this fall offensive comes, I believe uh, we have confidence in the El Salvadoran army. Uh, we think that the, the guerrillas could make things very uh, unpleasant uh, and we think that they are building up the possibility of such a thing. But now the election has taken place, the election of the president, and uh, Duarte is very definitely dedicated to uh, continuing uh, uh, to move toward democracy in El Salvador, <coughs> certainly has the support of the people. And uh, I am optimistic that we're on the right path. And our Congress has voted now to uh, give us the appropriation we asked for further aid to El Salvador. Mr. President, I'm going to ask you specifically the Irish question, as you're going to be the first country you want to touch down. And um, I'm familiar with what you said about um, Irish unity in the quest of not becoming involved uh, as between Ireland and England. But are there any circumstances which might change that? If, for instance, uh, Ireland were to join NATO, 
or such a question were mooted, would that make it more attractive, for instance, for America to support the idea of Irish unity? I really believe that that is an, that is an internal problem to be worked out. Uh, uh, first of all, because there are two governments involved, uh, uh, and the other government is already a, a member of NATO. I have been impressed with the, the forum and uh, some of its recommendations and the, as Prime Minister, your Prime Minister said, the, uh, that the recent finding of the forum of recommendations certainly provided an agenda uh, for serious thinking. But if there's any way in which uh, uh, without being uh, an interferer <laughs> in things going on there, but in which uh, the people of Ireland felt that we could in any way be helpful with anything that we might uh, do, we'd be very pleased to do it. I believe I'm in order in asking a supplementary. Um, on the question of these unprecedented protests, which are unheard of in terms of an American president visiting Ireland, one of the uh, factors in this is that there is a certain alienation between the Irish at home and the Irish here because uh, the quota of emigration has cut down the numbers of Irish with the day-to-day -day knowledge of America. Do you think that there is any likelihood that the Irish emigration quota might be increased? Well, now, the truth is, and I've only just recently heard about any problem of that, the truth is that Ireland's quota is 20,000, and based on the worldwide quotas, um, it is it's certainly equal to and proportionate to all the, uh, the others, but also uh, the quota has not been fully used. So, <laughs> so there isn't a waiting line there that uh, says there's no more room for us. It, they haven't used the, well, the quota that, that they There is a waiting line in Ireland that it mightn't have the right qualifications or so on. Well, it might, be that, or it to get might be that or it might just be the slow turning of bureaucratic wheels. <laughs> but uh, it's my understanding that the quota has not yet been filled. Mr. Thank President, you. you said the other day at your press conference you didn't expect any uh, real progress to take place on uh, uh, nuclear arms talks uh, this year. Do you think if you're re-elected uh, in November and uh, uh, the Soviet Union sees they're going to have to deal with you for another f four years that we could expect a, a fairly earn early return to the negotiating table, either on INF or START or both? Well, I know many people who are students of Soviet history and Soviet methods uh, feel that, that there's a better chance of them uh, deciding to join us in negotiations and things uh, after the election is over, but uh, they're not going to do anything in the meantime to help me get reelected. Now, I hope I am reelected and I look forward to, uh, to dealing with them. Uh, we, we have to live in the world together and uh, we have to seek peace together. But right now, if the Soviet Union and the men running the Soviet Union truly want peace, then there can be peace tomorrow because none of the rest of us want war. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Looking forward.